Good evening. Fantastic. You can uh, you can take a seat. And uh, can I say what a, it's a it's an honor. It's an honor to be here tonight. And um, you know, your pastor. I'm sure you've had many people from Hillsong Church come and uh, and speak here. And uh, you know. God always picks people, I think, and he sets people up that become voices into something. And uh, your pastor has been a, a voice into Hillsong Church that for as long as I've been a part of Hillsong Church, and I've been a part of Hillsong Church for 20 years. And uh, he's been one of those, those voices um, that God has used to, to shape the the, the who we who we are and so to be able to come here and and to to speak here tonight it's a great honor um, it's one of those nervous honors you have you know but it's a great honor and um, we've as the pastor said we've become really good friends over over the years and uh, it's a uh, it's a great honor to be called a friend to uh, you know, because he, he's, you know, he's older than me. You, you know that, don't you? <laughs> and so, uh, and when, you know, it's a strange thing in life when you, the people you look up to just over the course of time and faithfulness, you become friends, to, friends with the people you look up, look up to. And so to, to be able to stand here tonight and to, uh, to speak is, um, as I said, a great honor. And in our church in London, he is uh, much loved, to the, we, had a, we have a staff retreat where we take all our staff away and all of our key leaders and we have a retreat. And, um, and because it's, it's London, I, I just feel like I'm just an eternal youth pastor uh, because it's, there's just so many young people in church and you know, London is a young city, meaning the people who live there. And, uh, and their request after this year's staff retreat was, can we have one of the old guys? Is it possible to get Pastor Charles... And, uh, and I, I, was, I was really encouraged because I thought, to me, there, there's a real hunger because it was like they, they could have said any name of any of the up-and-coming superstar young preachers and teachers and pastors in the world, but they said, it'd be really good if we could have someone like Pastor Charles to come and do staff retreat <laughs> next year. So, uh, so he's, he's much loved in our church and uh, not just in London, but across Hillsong Church. But anyway, you ready for the word? Yep. All right. Father, I just just take this time. I commit this time to you. Father, I thank you for who you are. Thank you for everything that you did in Jesus because that makes everything that you are available to us. Holy Spirit, we ask you to take tonight's word and weave it into the context of our lives. We ask you and we let you do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so let me just uh, tonight give a little bit of context to to what I want to what I want to speak about, and uh, so then it'll 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 make sense. All right, is uh, just just over the last little while, I've I've, I've sort of looked at a, a few things or been looking for a few things to answer a question that I was asking. What, what is it that I could get everybody in our church to do that would, one, benefit them, two, benefit what they're a part of, three, benefit the city that we live in, and four, have an impact potentially on the world in which we live in? What would those, what, what, what could I get our church to do that would fulfill all of those things and at the same time, you, you don't have to be a Christian for 20 years to be able to do it. You could actually do it right now. You could make a decision to say, I'm going to do this right now. So I started to think about some things. And in those things, I came up with seven things. Now, there's probably more, but they're my seven. So, and seven's the magic number for God, remember? So, so seven works, works for me. And so... And in those seven things, I also looked at, as I just quickly wrote them, wrote them down, that I, I looked at 
at it and I recognize that there's a number of those things that if you were to apply these things, there would be an impact on your life and the impact would be that you would mature as a Christian. And uh, so to mature as a Christian, if we're not careful, one of the things that we, we think of is we think maturity is something that we suddenly start to do. We just, we become mature. Now, anyone who's got children knows that that doesn't happen. Yeah? Anyone who's married knows that that doesn't just happen. Right? Maturity, we can, uh, we've, we, a lot of us have met eight-year-old children who are more mature than our 70-year-old grandparents. Um, so maturity is not just something that you just do. And maturity is actually a fruit. It's, it's the result of something. It's, it's something that, that takes place in your life. And so in this, I sort of looked at some things and I noticed that there was a number of things that I, you call them catalysts that are going to cause you to, to mature as a, as a Christian. Right? So just to make it easy for everyone, I'm not gonna, there's seven of them and I'm only going to talk about one. All right? So that means I can come back six other times. Um, just, just joking, just joking, just joking. All right, and um, it's all right. And uh, so let me let me get into it. You ready? Let me pick up for you in uh, in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter chapter one. If you're here tonight, and maybe you're a new Christian, maybe you're new to new to all of this. Uh, I'm reading from from it's called Ephesians. It's in the New Testament. Written by a guy called Paul. He wrote a number of letters in the, in the New Testament that follow on after the Gospels. The Gospels meaning this is the story of, of Jesus. This is what tells us the, the whom Jesus was in the time that he, he lived. Paul wrote a series of letters to try and explain to us the impact of this, who this Jesus was, what he did for us and the significance of, of the cross, what it's all about how that works into our lives, how, what the resurrection life of Jesus is all about, how that works into our lives. And so he, he, he pens some letters to try and, I, I guess, put this way, explain to people this is what being, if we in our terms say, this is what being a Christian is, this is what living as a Christian is. So he, he pens pen some letters. So I'm going to read from the first part of Ephesians, which is, pretty obvious to some of you, but you might be new, and in the first chapter. This guy, Paul, most of the time in the first chapter, he introduces himself. He usually says, I, I Paul, appointed, which means you read on from here and don't question what I say. <laughs> All right, so he states his authority. He usually makes some statement about the awesomeness of God in some way. And then he usually goes into a prayer. And what I noticed about his prayer, he usually goes into a prayer, and then the rest of the letter some, somewhat unpacks what he prays is going to be a reality in people's lives, right? So I'm just putting context into what I'm, uh, what, what I'm going to, to, to read out for you. So let's, uh, let's, let's go from there. So Ephesians chapter 1, how's my accent? Is it working? I realize that we Australians do not have the easiest accent to listen to. So, um, so anyway, so let, let me pick it up here for you. So this is Paul and he's leading into a prayer. So he starts with, ever since I first heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people everywhere. Now that, that's, that's just one, one verse. Now let me just pause there for a moment. You notice he's starting off with, he says, I've heard something about you. And this is what I've heard about you. I've heard about your strong faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love for God's people everywhere. Now, let me just, just you know, pause here for a moment. Have you noticed in the Bible, when the Bible talks about God's ways are higher than our ways, God's wisdom is different to our wisdom. So in other words, it's a bit like God, everything we think we're gonna do and we're gonna do it our way, God flips it and says, no, this is how you should do it. If you do it what my way, it's generally the opposite way to our way, right? Oversimplification, but pretty much that's how it works, right? 
Now, if we're not careful, we take what we just heard here. He says, I've heard of your strong faith in Jesus Christ and your love for God's people everywhere. And we go, oh, yeah, that's true, but we live our lives like this. We, well, we're, gonna, we're Christians. We love God. And if we're not careful, we put our faith in people. Now, the problem with that is, it's not, nothing wrong with putting, nothing wrong with loving God. There's plenty wrong with putting your faith in people. Because this is what I've learned about putting your faith in people. They're going to let you down. And then you think, how do you know they're going to let you down? Because they're just like you. Right? Some of you are going, well, did he really say that? Yeah. Right? But this is what I've discovered is, if I put my faith in Jesus, he, he's never going to let me down. He doesn't let us down. And so, so the challenge is, 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 is we've got to make sure we live in our life, putting our faith in, in him. But then Paul commends him for your love for God's people everywhere. Now, our challenge is, our, our, is that love for God's people everywhere a, a, a reality in our lives? Right now, so, so as, I, as I read on, right, so that our love, our love one for, for, for one another, that, that sense of that God's love towards people. If you want to sit, you're sitting here tonight and you say, what, what do you mean by God's love towards other people? Well, human love generally works like this. I love my dog. I love my cat. Some people do, some people don't. I love my car. I love my wife. Sort of love my husband. And we talk about loving things or loving people and our context generally is, I love this thing or that person because of what they do for me, for how it makes me feel. But God's love's not like that. God's love's not about we love something because of what they do for us. We love them because of what we're doing for them. It's an expression of who we are towards someone else, not to get something back, but actually to express something that we have towards somebody else. You with me? Right? So he sort of tells us, he says, we've, we to, to, to love, to, the, he's commending these people for loving one another. All right? Then he goes on, he says, I've not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow in the knowledge of God. So, where, so where, do, where does God want us to grow? Or where, where's Paul encouraging us to grow? So if we're talking about Christian growth, if we're talking about growing as a believer, and wh how, where, where is he, why is he, what does he want us to grow in? He wants us to grow in the knowledge of God. That's what we grow in. Now, what we've got to be careful of, knowledge of God is not our heady understanding of God. When the Bible speaks about knowing God or the knowledge of God in this context, he's, it's a bit like when he says, you will know the truth and it will set you free. But he also says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? I am the truth. You will know the truth and it will set you free. Jesus is not, I've got the truth. Jesus is not a list of 10 principles of what is true. Jesus is what truth looks like. When you get to know that truth personally, it will set you free, right? So knowledge is meaning by experience, I get to know Jesus, you with me? All right, so, the, so by experience, the more I experience him, the more I get to know him, the more I get to know him, the more I grow in the knowledge of him. So that's, that's what we're wanting to do, wanting to grow in the knowledge of God. Essentially, that's what maturing is. The more we get to know Jesus, growing in the knowledge of him, we begin to mature in the, in the process of this, right? So let me just come into thinking about when I said before about, about catalyst, about maturing, what, what is, what is the, one of the seven things that I'm going to talk about in this? So just, just setting this up. The first, first thing that this is what, what I, I just looked at, and it's not my idea. It's something I've heard from somewhere and worked it. But, but one of the things that we've got to make sure that we are, understand about our lives is every single one of us needs social connection. Every single one of us needs to be in a place where we are socially connected with, with, other, with other people. There is, there, where we are, we are 
by nature as human beings, all right, we are social beings. We're, we're, that's fundamentally what we are. That, that's who we are. We're, we're, there is something in the, in the makeup of who we are as individuals that is social. That meaning we, we connect with each other, right? Now, if you, for example, you look at the, the, in, in the Bible, you go right back at the start, at Genesis. What, what happens in Genesis? You go through the first couple of chapters and, and God created it, God did this, God did this. He ends up with man and he says, this is good. We end up in Genesis chapter three. And what do we end up with? We end up with humanity going pear-shaped because what we end up with is man falls out with God, Adam and Eve. The direct result of man falling out with God is what? He fell out with himself. The, the relationship one-on-one -on -one at a personal connection with another human being also su suffered because this one suffered. Now we know long-term big picture, get to the, essentially get to sort of to the end of my message. So what is the gospel? God fixes up this because it, in Jesus, because God fixes up this in Jesus, this is fixed up as Jesus works in our lives as we demonstrate his love towards one another, right? Now, I understand that what I'm talking about right now is like, oh, this is primary school. No, this is kids' church. This is like really basic. This is like teaching ducks to quack. <laughs> All right? Now, here's the problem. Sometimes the ducks just need to be taught how to quack. All right? So, so our challenge is, 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 is this, this social connection thing. Now, let me just set it up a, a, a little bit, bit more. For example, in, in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, pick it up in verse 42, it says this, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the, uh, to, to, to the common meal, to prayer, and to fellowship. You read down a few more verses, you get to, Verse 47, and it says this, it says, and the Lord added to their fellowship daily. This is New Living Translation. Now, notice what did the Lord add to? The Lord added to their fellowship. It doesn't say the Lord added to their prayer meeting. It doesn't say the Lord added to the apostles' teaching. It doesn't say the Lord added to the common meal. It said the Lord added to their fellowship daily. Now, that term fellowship, it's an old word, we don't use it that much, but that term fellowship is, is talking about the social connection that these people had with each other. That social connection that they had with each other, fellowship meaning it's, it's, got, a, it's got an edge which is pecuniary, which means basically it's like interest of. So I'm in relationship with, these people were in relationship with each other, or if I say I'm in fellowship with somebody, what it's saying is, is I'm in a relationship, a social connection, where what is going on in your life is of my concern and my interest, and I want to try and help you. I want to see your life benefit. Do you, do you get what, you with me? Right? So, so this, so this, this in, in Acts chapter 2, this is, it's, it's a great display of this, this social connection thing. Yet it's interesting, as I said, what did God add to? So if we're talking about building the church, if we're talking about the church growing, etc., etc., what does the Lord add to? He adds to the fellowship. In other words, he adds to the social connection or the social dynamic of the church. Now, for example, I'll ask you a question. Tonight, when you come here tonight, when you're a part of maybe church on Sunday, so do you attend church or do you belong to the church? How you answer that question fundamentally will determine how your Christianity will play out. It has a fundamental impact on what Christianity is going to look in your life if you're somebody that attends to something or you're somebody that says, I'm actually a part of this family unit, I'm a part of this community of people, that what Paul says in Romans chapter 12, just before he goes into the motivational gifts, what's he say? He says that we all belong to each other. 
We are, in effect, the church of Jesus Christ. We don't attend church. We are the church. And when we come on a night like this, we are the people of God coming together, the community of God gathering together. We're not individuals. We're unique people that is a part of the body of Christ. See, if I'm an individual that's attending, it will define my Christianity completely different to me seeing myself as I'm a unique part that belongs. Do you get, get what I'm saying? All right, so I promise you I'm going somewhere with all this, all right? So, so hang on, right? So get back to we are social, we're social beings. So we're socially connected. If we understand some of the fundamental motivations for us as human beings, all right, so... One of the fundamental, a couple of the fundamental motivations are this. Every single one of us longs to be known. There's something inside of us that wants to be known by somebody else. We want, we want people to know us. We want people to, we want people to know what we feel about things. We want people to know what we like. We want people to know what we don't like. We actually we, we want people to know what's, what's bad in our lives. We want people to know what's good in our lives. We, not only that, we have this desire that is uniquely human that says, not only do I want to be known, I want to actually know. I want to know somebody. I, I want to know you. I want to know the person that, that I'm, in, I'm in relationship with. I want to know you. I want to know what makes you tick. I want to know, I want to know what, what makes you happy. I want to make, know what makes you sad. There is this, that's why the unredeemed nature loves to get into gossiping about people because it's just the unredeemed human spirit that has just got to get in and know what's going on in someone's life. But when it's redeemed, it's I want to know because I want to connect with you. That means uniquely human for us to know and for us to be known by other people, right? Another thing that is uniquely human about us and when it comes to just being, being a human being is, is we, need to, we need to be in relationships with where we can process and we can share life's experiences, where, where we can process. What do you mean by process? You know where you can, you just want to sit down with somebody and when you sit down with that somebody, all you want to do is just go, blah. Can I just get it all off my chest? Can I just tell you what is going on in my life? I need to process this with you. I need to talk this through. I need to get some dialogue going. I need some wisdom. I need you to help shape my thinking. I need you. We all need that. We need to be able to process things with people. We need to be able to sit down with people and we need to be able to go get things off our chest and then at the same time for that somebody to say, you know, it's all going to be okay. It's all going to be okay because you know what? We serve a big God. And in your moment right now, you might think that you've got a big problem and a little God, but sometimes we just need people to remind us one-on-one -on -one no, you've got a little problem in comparison to our big God. And over the course of time, over the course of life, what you're going to find over the course of time, over the course of life, you're going to see this big God work in your big problem. And as he takes you through it, you're going to look back over your shoulder of the course of your life and you're going to say, that big problem is so far in the distance now, it just looks like a little problem because somebody helped me get my eyes off myself and eyes onto my big God. We need that. It's uniquely human. We need to be able to share life's experiences. We, we, want, to be able to, we, we, we want to be able to tell people what's going on in our lives. We want to be able to say, hey, hey, we just had a baby. We want to be able to say, hey, we just, we just, I'm getting married or, or whatever it might be that we, we love to, sh we need to be able to and want, ha want to be able to share the high points of life and at the same time, we need to and want to be able to share the low points of life. We, we, they say that in, within the human spirit, there's something unique about being human that we can almost handle anything providing we don't do it by ourselves. There's something about us as human beings, as if we can handle anything as long as we don't have to handle it alone. So that's that, I need to be able to what? To know, 
I need to be able to be known as uniquely human. I need to, I, I need to be able to process life. I need to be able to share life and its experiences, its tragedies, its, its, its incredible joys. It's uniquely human. Now, there's something else that motivates us as human beings that is also uniquely human. And, and that is, is we, as human beings, are, are motivated by the fear of rejection. The, now, the, the fear of reject, that you reject, fear of rejection. If you knew me, you might not accept me. If you knew what was happening in my life, you would put your hand out and you would distance yourself from me. That's uniquely human. So now the interesting thing is, is what's uniquely human to us when it comes to our fear of rejection, that people are gonna, that people are gonna withdraw from us favor, all right? They're gonna withdraw their favor from us is a, is a, is a motivator. Yet the funny thing is, is if you look at it, the third thing that I just said is the thing that actually prevents us from stepping into social connection that enables us to know and to be known, to process, to share. And so we hold people at a distance. And you think, no, why do we hold people? Have you ever asked yourself, why do I hold people at a distance? Why am I scared to actually really just share who I am? Because we're scared they're gonna reject us. Where does that come from? Well, that comes from the unredeemed, that comes from the fallen nature. Because see, if you go back to Adam and Eve in, in Genesis chapter three, just before they were tempted and just before they made a decision to go their way, where were they? They were in relationship with God. They were in relationship with each other. They were naked before God and they were naked before each other and they felt no shame. The moment there becomes distance between them and God, what, what happened? They immediately, they hide, they hide from God in the garden and then they hide from each other. And what do they do? They sow fig leaves to cover themselves up so that they can't be seen. So what do we do? How does that outplay in our lives? We put masks on. We present ourselves a certain way. Got to take a selfie. Oh, that's not a good angle. Oh, oh, that'll do. Then we flick through, filter. That'll do. Post, because I've, I've got the right angle, got the right filter. I've put up who I am, but I'm not really that. Um, I put it out. I only get two likes. <laughs> now I've got two likes. I'm all discouraged because I put it out for people who don't even know me to accept me. I get rejected, and now people I don't even know are discouraging me. Yeah? That's, that's part of that. And so this, but so what does Jesus put back in place for us the moment we put our faith in him? We put our faith in him, he restores our relationship with him, right? And in that restoration of that relationship with him, we find ourselves, if we're in right relationship with him, meaning that our right relationship is all based on his works, not my works. See, we get our relationship with him only messed up when we think the qualification is our works. The basis of our relationship with Jesus is faith in him, not faith in our works to please him. Our rightness comes from faith in his works. You with me? All right, so he puts that right. Now, because that is the basis 
of my relationship with him as faith in him. Everything that comes with me, I'm not saying it's okay, but it's actually baggage that he works through as opposed to baggage I work through so that my relationship with him is going to be right. That my relationship with him, according to his finished work, doesn't change at all based on my baggage. Do you get what I'm trying to say? All right? So, saying all that, let me just stop, make some sense of tonight's message, all right? So, so, fundament, so fundamentally, we're, we're social beings. So social connection, being connected with each other, is a, is a huge part of what this, is, this Christian life is, is, is all about, right? Now, so, so our, 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 our challenge is to form strong social connection with, with each other. Let me read to you. A, uh, the results of a survey that I read just recently. So it's not a recent survey, but in 1985, there was a cross-section survey done where people were asked this question, how many confidants do you have? Now, if you're thinking, what's a confidant, right? A confidant is the person you sit down and go, blah, with. And because they're a confidant, they don't go, oh, whoa, that, that's somebody who goes, whoa, that explains a lot, um, or whatever. And you know the fact that they're a confidant, you know that they're not going to tell anybody else. You know they're, gonna, they're tight-lipped. They've got, they keep their mouth shut. The only people who know anything about this is you, them, and God. That's what a confidant is. So this survey asked people, how many confidants do you, do you have and this was the answer. In 1985, the answer was this, three. three pe- people had an average of three people that they could connect with where they had confidence. The challenge then, his, the survey was done again in 2004, which was 12 years ago, right? 2004... This same survey was done, and this was the most common answer. The most common answer for one quarter of everybody surveyed, one, how many confidants do you have, was this. None. Absolutely none. That was, that was 12 years ago. That was before the latest phenomena that is taking place in Western society where we are way more connected, yet mental illness and health issues associated with isolation and loneliness are skyrocketing. The growth curve, if you put it like that, is about the same incline as our connectedness with each other in the world in which we live in. So somehow we are more connected, at the same time we are more disconnected. So that was, that's before this. So this, 12 years ago, as far as I understand, like it was only, probably only about 15 years ago that this thing called the internet become a part of our daily life. So we're connected with social media. And I'm not banging on social media. I'm just saying where things are at. So, so the whole challenge is, so if we come back to one thing that can impact your life, one impact thing that can impact the whole of this church, one thing that can touch this, this city, one thing that potentially can have a ripple effect into society and beyond is, is creating authentic human social connection for people of which the church should be the leading place on the planet for this phenomena. Your ability, your your well-being to be able to connect with people, your, the, the other people's well-being because you connect with them. The, the, state of society where loneliness and isolation, now I don't know what it's like here in your city, but in, in London they say loneliness and isolation is probably the number one issue that people face. The number one issue where people are lonely, where they people feel isolated, they don't have people that they can be known to, that they can know, that they can share and process 
life's experiences. They're, they're isolated. So if we, I believe if we can get this right in our church community, then suddenly we, we, start, to, we start to have an impact. We start to, to make a difference. Do you get one? Right? No, I know this is, this is, I know this is really simple, but you know, because this is, this is where they say it's going to, right? So, you know, like for example, I'll just give you a note, because you're doing marriage, counts, marriage courses and all that, so everyone here's got a great marriage, right? So, um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm not a marriage counselor, so don't come to me for marriage counseling. I'm a marriage survivor, not a marriage... Um, <laughs> it's like... It's like and um, this, is, this is what they say, right? For, for, you know, the other day I was in, 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 uh, in Phoenix and I was with Terry Chris and we're out at dinner and there was a wedding taking place where we're having dinner and the bride had nine bridesmaids. I mean, what's with that? Now, I don't know how you do it in America, but all I'm thinking about is father of the bride money, nine, bri- nine bridesmaids. So... So you think, so when you get married, you've got all those bridesmaids and all those friends. He's got all those groomsmen, all those friends. They all turn up to a wedding. Then you, you get married not too long and after a while, it's no longer it's your friends. No, after a while, it's no longer her friends. It's just you and her. And so then we, if we're not careful, we head into sort of cutesy, cutesy Christian marriage where it's just you and me, love, you and me against the world. Uh, and um, and we go from being husband and wife to we then add in we're also best friends, which means we're each other's confidant. We don't have any other confidants. And then the, the, where I was studying this survey goes on to say, so a lot of marriage situations end up these days where the problem is, is the only person that the people in the marriage have to talk to about life is, is each other until the other becomes the problem in the other person's life. So now, my problem is, is my confidant is my problem. <laughs> yeah? You see, see where I'm going with this? So it sort of goes like this. It goes, what are you thinking about, darling? Tell me what you're thinking about. Because if we're not careful, we, we will, you know, in, our, in the way we do things, we, we, so it's, t- this is marriage counseling 101 from Gary, all right? So, little, side, little digress. So, she will isolate all of his friends from him because, yeah, well, I just don't want him to have those friends anymore because I'm his friend. He will, he will isolate all her friends from her because he's scared that she's going to talk to them about him. And you know, I've discovered it better for her to talk to his, her girlfriends about you than for her to talk to you about you. <laughs> Just putting it out there. <laughs> so it's like, so this scenario. So uh, what you thinking about? What are you thinking about? Tell me what you're thinking about. What are you thinking? <laughs> Nothing. Can I put this out here? Us guys, we can sit there and think about nothing. (laughs) Men can do that. Girls, you have to understand, men can sit there and go, what are you thinking about? Nothing. (laughs) What do you mean you think about nothing? I'm thinking about nothing. Oh, come on, tell me what you're thinking about. Please tell me, please, come on, tell me what you're thinking about. Well, I'm thinking about you. And then she's like, I knew it. I knew it. You think. So tell me what you're thinking about me. Well, I'm just thinking about at this moment that I married a cow. <laughs> now, see, guys can do that. And the next minute, they forgot they ever said it. But girls can't hear that and forget it was ever said. So she, five years down the track, says, as we have a wedge between our marriage, says, I can't believe that five years ago, I asked you what you were thinking, and you were thinking that you'd married a cow. But see, if he had a circle of friends, 
He would have just gone down the pub. That's what we do in England. You go down the pub, whatever you do here, and you go to the shooting range. That's what Texans do. So whatever it is. And, um, and, you, and you'd say to your mates, your friends who you've had a long time in this circle of friends. I'm wasting my time, sorry. We had a whole lot of, you've had all these friends for a long time. And you go down and you're with your mates and your mate says, you know, what's going on? Oh, man, I'm just, she's just driving me crazy. I don't know what to do. And then the mate, this is what girls, you've got to understand, this is what mates do. So that's why he's got to let him have friends because the mate goes, you know, I've known, I've known you a long time. Yeah, I know, we've been friends for a long time, even before I was married. He says, yeah, you know, before you were married, you're an idiot. <laughs> and even... You're still an idiot. <laughs> See, guys can do that to each other. A, a, a guy can tell his best friend he's an idiot, and he'll go, oh, thanks. <laughs> he'll do that. So then we come back to, tell me, what are you thinking about? <laughs> I'm thinking about you. <laughs> really? Yeah. What are you thinking? I'm just thinking about how much I love you. Because oh. he just got it off his chest to his mate and everything. Oversimplification. But man, just saved a lot of marriages tonight. <laughs> so, so here's the challenge, right? In two minutes and 14 seconds, let me give you a take home, all right? We've, our challenge is, is can we create an environment right, where we can remove this fear of rejection so that we can enter into and create a culture where people can be known and know, where they can share and process life's experiences and have no fear of rejection. Can we create a culture like that? Because I believe we can, because see, that culture is just, just really just, just simply based on, on, a, on a couple of things that if we can work into our lives, and this is just, let me give them to you real quick to think about. John chapter 13, verse 34 says this. Jesus says, for us to love each other, how he loved us. Now, if we can just love each other, creating an environment where it's like, we're gonna love each other how Christ loved us. So therefore, for me to be able to love the person, the people I'm around and create an environment. See, see, Christ's love is not based on performance. Christ's love is based on the whom he is expressed to somebody else. Just simple, just love. We, our, our challenge is can we, can we love other people how Christ loved us? The, the next, next, next verse I'll give it to you is Romans chapter, chapter 15, verse, verse seven, where where. Where Paul says, just simply, he says, I want you to accept other people how Christ accepted you. So, so how am I going to accept you? If I'm going to be a Christian, I'm going to accept you based on how Christ accepted me. Now, his acceptance of me is based on my faith in him. Not based on my, my performance to earn my acceptance of him. Not, not, not the shock horror of better get it all sorted out before I come to Jesus. No, it's come to Jesus and he helps me get it all sorted out because my acceptance is not based on my performance. My acceptance is based on the, what, who he is and what he did. So therefore, I should be able to come to Christ and I should be able to come to him and say, and without any fear of rejection, if I'm putting my faith in the finished work of Jesus, then I have no fear of rejection. I have no fear of him pushing me aside. You know, in Romans chapter 10, where it says, you know, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, we'll be saved. Come down to verse 13, and we will not suffer disgrace. Meaning, he will not withdraw his favor from us. All right, so we've got, can we accept others how he, he has accepted us? And then Colossians chapter three, verse 13, really, really quite simple, is, is, can, is forgive others how Christ forgave us. Can we create an environment where we can say, you know what? I can forgive how Christ forgave me. I can forgive you how Christ forgave me. Not I can forgive you providing you do. Because see, Christ's forgiveness for me is not forgive you providing you do. 
It's not accept you providing you do. It's not love you providing you do. It's love you, accept you, forgive you the same way Jesus loved, accepted, and forgave me. Forgave me. He, he forgave me. See, sometimes as, as, as believers, we can get he forgave me. Yeah, he, forgot, he forgave my yesterday. And I know he's gonna forgive my tomorrow. I'm just having trouble with getting my head around. He forgives my now. Because I gave my life to Jesus, I accepted His forgiveness and all of that sort of thing. And then I stepped into the next day of my Christian walk and failed. And have been, quite frankly, failing every day since. And we get all caught up in trying to, I've given my life to Jesus, He forgave all my past and now I've got to earn the right to stay in relationship with Him as opposed to being able to say, you know what? He forgives my yesterday, He forgives my today, He forgives my tomorrow. I've got to learn how to live in a perpetual state of forgiveness. And then guilt, condemnation, shame don't rule my life. But can I exhibit that to other people? If we grab hold of and and understand that, if we look at this and we think, the way we accept, the way we reject, The way we love, the way we don't love, the way we forgive, the way we don't forgive other people is a direct representation of our perception of how this relationship is working. So when Paul says he wants us to grow in the knowledge of Christ, he wants us to grow in things like, I know his love, I know his forgiveness, I know his acceptance. As I grow in that, the fruit of that and the evidence of that is I can exhibit his love I can love how I've been loved. I can forgive how I've been forgiven. I can accept how I have been been accepted. If we can get this one worked out, because that's what he, he puts this one right, so this one, so the same way as sin entered the heart of man, messed up this one, messed up this relationship, Jesus fixes up this relationship, and the fruit of it is he fixes up this relationship if we can nail that if we can nail that where do we find ourselves we find ourselves in a place where literally hey we're creating an environment where other people other people can come into and this whole isolation and loneliness thing that's an epidemic in society the church suddenly is the answer to probably the number one need in people's lives amen amen can we stand to our feet can I pray for you and uh, I, want, I would just want to pray a really simple, simple prayer. And um, Father, come on, why don't we just lift our hands towards him? Lord, use us, Father. Help us, Lord, to come into this place of knowing you. Help us to come in this place where we can love, accept, forgive how you have for us. Lord, I pray for people here tonight that are, that are isolated. I pray for people who are lonely. I pray for people who fear being rejected. I pray that you give them the strength to to step out, cross the line and engage other people and form meaningful social connection in their lives. Lord, I pray for people who, without intentionally being like it, it, without making a, it's, it's not intentional, but find themselves being critical, find themselves being judgmental, find themselves dismissing people find themselves gossiping about people. I pray that you help them, Lord, that you help them to to sort that because, Lord, we want to create authentic, genuine Christian community that becomes an answer in the world in which we live. In Jesus' name, amen.